Good morning. It's good to have you with us again today. Thank you for joining with us. We are in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're in chapter 11. Last week we began that chapter. We started in those first few verses seeing a, a glimpse of the temple on earth. And it reminded us that the Lord is making a distinction there. It reminds us about the gospel. He makes a distinction in those verses. He says, rise and measure and do not measure. And he's separating out those who are believers, who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And the Lord is separating out those who have rejected Jesus Christ as Savior in unbelief. Those are the two groups that we see here in Revelation and, of course, in life today. And he's making that separation in the midst of Revelation. He shows us his ministry of the gospel. He shows us the two witnesses. We spent time last week looking at those two witnesses. They are gospel bearers. I believe the 144,000 Jews that are saved and sealed for ministry are the result of these two witnesses. I believe they are impactful in what happens in that first half of the tribulation. They protect Israel. They help Israel build that temple. I think they, they are instrumental in that covenant being made, forced forcing the Antichrist to make that covenant. God's sovereignty. We see all those things. And yet the gospel is front and center. Man is given an opportunity to receive Christ or to reject Jesus Christ. That's a, that's a great setup as we move into verse 15 where we're at today. We're in verses 15 through 19. We come to a, a, a turning point, a pivot point here in Revelation because now the finality of God's work is coming into play. We have, we have this last trumpet which will release the final judgments. So let's pick that up. It, it, it prompts a question to us. This passage does, this text to us, uh, built upon what we've already seen. Jesus Christ has promised here he will rule and he will reign. What is your response? What is my response to Jesus Christ? What, uh, what's our response to him when he says, I, I want to I have your life. I want to I lead your life. I want to have control of your, of your life. I want you to follow me. I want you to obey me. I want to be the Lord of your life. I want to be your savior from sin. I am the one who, who you need for, for eternal forgiveness, for washing of sins, for purpose in life, for mission in life. Jesus puts himself on the throne of our heart. He places himself on the throne of, of eternity in heaven and earth. And he says, what, what is your response going to be? How will you respond to the gift that I bring, to the truth that I lay before you? about who I am and why I came to earth. What is our response to the claim that Jesus says, I am King of kings and Lord of lords. I have come to reign and to rule over your life, over your heart, over your destiny. Well, we see the beginning, beginning of the end here in this, in this verse 15, and we see the seventh trumpet. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. This is the last trumpet. We've had the six seals of God's wrath. The seventh seal led to a half hour of silence in heaven. Solemn, the holiness of God, the judgment about to come. It, it led to the seven trumpets. Those seven trumpets have been more judgment upon the earth, including the three woes. This is the third woe, the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet now sounds. As there was an interlude between the sixth, the seventh seal and the first trumpet, there's going to be an interlude between the seventh trumpet and the first bowl of judgment. We see here in, in Revelation, it's not until chapter 15 that we see the, the results of this actual blast of the seventh trumpet. It sounds now, but we don't see the result of that until, chap until chapter 15. He's going to give us more important information between here and those results that we're going to see. The first thing that we see coming out of the text, again, gospel-related, is the proclamation that is made. And we see that in, in verse 15 clearly. And the seventh trumpet uh, angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, folks. There's no ambiguity there. The kingdom of Jesus Christ, folks, it is here now. The Greek is written in such a way that even though it hasn't actually happened because we have these these seven bowls yet to take place it is so certain it is the this this final end is so certain leading into the kingdom it's as though it's right here in fact it is because the kingdom is now the 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 kingdom of satan is going to be destroyed in these final seven bowl judgments and the kingdom of jesus christ will be laid before us it is the kingdom of our savior 
Jesus Christ, it is forever and ever. We see that in Daniel clearly, chapter 2, verse 44, and other places that we could go to. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It, it won't be left to another kingdom. Other kingdoms cannot destroy it. He will bring all other kingdoms to an end, and it will stand forever. No one can stand before the final work of Jesus Christ. Isaiah reminds us that, that the literal ministry began when he was a child, when he was a son. Even though he was from eternity past, he stepped into humanity as not only the Son of God, but the Son of Man. He took on flesh. And he, he is given an eternal kingdom here. He is mighty. He is everlasting. His government will have no end. The, he, is, he is a fulfillment of the Davidic promise, uh, promises to David, the line of David. His kingdom will be eternal and forever. We're going to draw from Psalm 2 this morning in, uh, throughout as we go throughout because it's a messianic psalm and, it, and it, it deals directly with what we see here in these verses. We see here in Psalm 2 this promise from God. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill, in other words, in Jerusalem. I will tell of this decree. This is the decree. The Lord said to me, this is God, this is God speaking to God of his son, the father and the son. You are, you are my son, and today I have begotten you. I have, I have elevated you in prominence where you belong, where you have always been, now before the people. Ask of me, and here's what, I'll, here's what I'll do. I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. It has always been his. He created all things. Now he is being given those very possessions because of his obedience to his father, carrying out the will of his father. We see prophetically this, this promise being made. You know, it's interesting. The Lord, the Lord, as he leads you and I just day to day, one of the things that he calls us to do is simply to be people who, who pray, who talk to him daily, who say, Lord, I need you today. And when I pray, I'm saying, Lord, I need you. And here's how the Lord has taught us to pray. When the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, what did he teach them? Matthew 6. He said, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, that promise, that prayer, our prayer is now being fulfilled in these verses here in chapter 11. That kingdom that we've prayed for is now coming. You know, we pray every day that, that what is happening in heaven would take place on earth, that, that the character of, of the Lord's heart would be exhibited as the character of our life and be seen by others, that people's lives would turn now to Jesus Christ and receive Him as Savior and place Him on the throne of their life. This prayer is being fulfilled here. Another thing that's being fulfilled, and this is so key in this in this verse, is simply the, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Not only that, but what it leads to. It leads to worship, verse 16 and 17. And the 24 elders who sat on the thrones before God, and we've seen these 24 elders, they, they fall on their faces. Boy, haven't we seen that here in Revelation. And they simply worship God. God. And they say, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power, and what? You ha you're, you're not going to reign. You have begun to reign. See see how, the, how God is approaching the reality of, of the reign of Jesus Christ? He has already begun to reign. As he's pouring wrath out upon the earth, he is subduing, destroying the work of Satan. And he has already begun his reign as he brings this wrath upon the earth. It's God. It's God alone. And it, it leads to worship. You know, in our life, one of the greatest joys is when we simply look at, at through the, the pages of our life, the journals of our life, the stories of our life, the narratives of things that unfold, and, and are able to say, you know what, this is what God did. And God did this. And you know what, and God did this. And the only explanation is God. And those are the greatest stories. Those are the greatest narratives. They're not about us. They're about how God has used us, how he, how he used you, how he gifted you, how he gave you opportunity, how he put you in a moment in time. But you know what? At the end of the day, that story, if we are, if we are followers of Jesus Christ and here for his glory, it's always about him. And it leads us to worship. And when we worship, we exalt him. And we place him high over us where he belongs and we say lord it's all about you it's all about your glory 
God, I want, I want people to see you. I want people to give honor to you. I want people to see Christ. That's what's happening here. It is about Jesus Christ. He's begun to reign. You know what is happening? It's a celebration, folks. This is heavenly celebration. This is, these verses are, are giving us a perspective of revelation from the viewpoint of heaven. That's really important to see and to understand. And so as John shares this truth in these words, that Jesus Christ is on the throne, and he is reigning, and he will reign, and his kingdom is coming, and his kingdom has come, and he is to be worshipped, and he is to be adored, and he is to be lifted up and to be exalted over everyone and all things. You know, the world watches us as a church. The world watches your life. And they see, they see your conviction of Jesus Christ and your proclamation of Jesus Christ and your adherence to Jesus Christ, your obedience to Jesus Christ. They see the certainty of Christ in your life. And they're going to have one of two responses. Well, we see a response here in the text. You've begun to take your power. And so we see in verse 18, with simplicity, these three words, and the nations raged. You see, all the way through this tribulation, what have we seen the nations do? What have we seen the peoples of the world do? Not repent, but rage at God. Rage at God. You know, again, we go back to Psalm chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. And this is what they say. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. You know, sin leads us to hate who Christ is. When I am in bondage to sin, I hate who Christ represents. I hate who he is. I, I want nothing to do with him. I don't want his claim on my life. I don't want to yield to him. There's a freedom that I feel in my ability to do whatever I want, whenever I want, and I certainly don't want to, to be called to yield to Him, to be obedient to Him, to follow Him, because I don't see the, the grace and the freedom and the transformation that I have in Christ. Sin keeps me from seeing that. Psalms reminds us, this is a glimpse of what we see right here taking place in Revelation. Sinners hate God. Sinners hate the claim of Christ on their life. Sinners hate the thought of giving, of giving Christ the priority of their life, of following after Jesus Christ. And that's why they are so stubborn throughout Revelation. They're just as stubborn as you and I. I still have a stubborn streak in me, don't you? There are times that you find yourself saying, I don't want to do it God's way. Not today, not right now. I know what I should do. I don't want to do that. Because that's sin that's in us. It's the impulse of sin that's in us still. And here he defines the character quality of the unbeliever. They simply do not want the authority of Jesus Christ over their life. And the nations raged. And then we see, we see the finality of what Jesus says. He brings us to finality in this verse. This is what he says. Okay, so your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged. He says, the nations rage, but your wrath came and the time for the, for the dead to be judged. He reminds us here that there is a divine certainty and that certainty is wrath. The dead are those who are dead spiritually. The dead are those who will be slaughtered because of their unbelief and die a physical death and then be held accountable and will die then a spiritual death separated from Christ for all eternity. And God's wrath is now being poured out. And the seven bowls are about to pour out, and it will affect the whole earth. You know, sin affects the whole earth. And the whole earth is in rebellion to God, apart from those who are being saved. Again, we see in Psalm chapter 2, He who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. And then He will speak to them in His wrath, and He will terrify them in His fury. And you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And that's what the Lord is doing here in Revelation. And it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart that unbelievers cannot see and will not see and will not yield to the grace of Jesus Christ. 
I want you to remember, in the midst of this wrath, there is the grace of God that is flooding the earth. The love of God is being communicated in so many ways here in the book of Revelation. And today, the gospel is going out. And you're hearing it right now. But when I stand in opposition and defiance to God, then that brings the wrath of God down upon me. And that's what we see. God says, there's nothing you can do to stop what is coming apart from faith in Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 10. We see the Lord Himself, because they deny Him, He will deny us. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my fathers in heaven. That's the, that's the worst denial ever to take place in history. When, when man stands before the Father, unprotected by faith in Jesus Christ, unprotected by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, having rejected salvation, the provision of eternal life, and they stand there naked before the Father with nothing to, to give to the Father to, to satisfy the righteous, holy wrath of God. And Jesus will say to His Father about, about them, I never knew you. I don't know you. You're not one of mine. You don't belong to me. You're not a part of the family. And they will be separated for all eternity. I trust that is never and will never be your experience. Verse 18 but your wrath came and the time to be judged. But here's the other side. There's, there's finality. The finality is wrath. It is now coming. It cannot be stopped. But there still is time for grace. And that grace leads us to this other proclamation of finality and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, both small and great. Jesus says here there is a reward coming. There's wrath coming in these seven bowls, but he says, you know what else is coming? There's reward coming. Remember, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is here. That means reward. That means blessing, eternal blessing. He says you are on the precipice of that eternal reward. And Jesus is promising. He promises to you and I, because we stand in Jesus Christ, to every child of God, to every believer, reward. He says here to the prophets and the saints, but that just is the whole picture. That's the Old Testament believers. That's the New Testament believers. Those who fear your name, that's, that's all of us who call upon the name of Jesus Christ, both great and small. He is, there's no favoritism with Jesus Christ. He saves us regardless of our standing, regardless of our status in this world. He sees us all as needy people, and His grace is extended to everyone in every generation at every time. And when we receive Jesus Christ... He promises reward. Not just eternal reward. You know what? Part of that is the, is the blessing. It's the privilege of reward even today as we serve Him. The blessing of Him walking with us and, and equipping us and empowering us and, and giving us joy in the midst of every day. And so He says again in Psalm 2, He says, Be careful. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry. Seek His favor, is what He's saying here. Lest He be angry and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. That's the only hope that the dwellers on earth here in this passage, that's the only hope they have is to take refuge in Him in the midst of the certain coming judgment in the pages to follow here. And so there is a divine certainty, destruction, but there is a divine certainty as well, reward. God will pour His wrath out on the earth. He, to unbelievers, He will reward the children of God, those who have put their faith and trust in Him. But we see this last phrase in verse 18 and he will destroy the destroyers of the earth. That is utter destruction. Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, those who have been leaders and followed with him, he will destroy them utterly. Yes, they will live for eternity. They will suffer and face the wrath of God for eternity. They'll not be annihilated. They'll not go out of existence, but he will destroy their work, destroy their kingdom, destroy everything that they are, and they will be left with nothing but judgment. And then in verse 19, he shares these words with us, this challenge with us, this reality with us, his faithfulness. And God's temple in heaven, 
was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and earthquake and heavy hail. And we see here a beautiful, a beautiful reality in this verse. We see the covenant of God, the ark of the covenant. Not the same as the ark. Not that's not the same ark of the covenant that we saw in the Old Testament. That was always a shadow of what was to come, the true ark of the covenant and the very presence of God. We see the ark of the covenant, but see here's here's what it communicates: the very presence and power of God, the very integrity and faithfulness of God. The ark of the covenant here in heaven, this fully realized version in the very presence of God is a reminder to Israel, to the Gentiles, to us, that the Word of God is the faithfulness of the character of God. It's His promise to us. 2 Timothy 2. The saying is trustworthy. If we have died with Him, we will live with Him. Folks, that's great. We die to Him and we find life. If we endure, we will reign with Him. In other words, we are people of faith all the way through. If we deny Him, He'll deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. To the believer, he will reward. To the unbeliever, he will deny. Because he cannot deny his promises. He has made a promise in his word. To all who receive Jesus Christ, they will find life. To all who reject Jesus Christ, they will be punished and judged. That's what this verse is reminding is, is showing us. God is faithful to his word. To believer and unbeliever alike. Our faith is essentially important as well. As we look at the character of Jesus Christ, who is reminding us in the Ark of the Covenant that He is faithful, He reminds us that faith is the key to everything that we do. Faith is the beginning of salvation. It is the root of salvation. It is from, from what salvation springs, and it is from God. We're saved through faith, and it is from God. He, he supplies and gives us that faith that we can be saved. If you're saved today, would you just thank the Lord? Will you just praise Him? Because the faith that that you extended to him was one he gave you because of his grace and his blessing, his favor. We're called to walk by faith. Walk by faith, not by sight. We don't walk by what we see. We walk by what we see and hear. We don't walk by how we can figure out our circumstances in life and our tomorrows. We can't figure those things out. We walk by faith in his word. We walk by faith in his character. We walk by faith. We trust him. The source of that faith is the word of God. He extends faith. We extend faith to Him. How? Because we hear, because we listen, because we follow after the Word of God. Faith faith is drawn from the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God. The reward of that is, is promised. Because of faith, He promises to reward. Without faith, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible to do anything, to please Him. But you know what? When I, when I live by faith, you and I, we are able to please the Lord in all that we do. Each day we're able to please the Lord. You know, what a blessing that is to know that God wants to use us, chooses to use us, gives us the privilege of pleasing Him. Whoever draws near to Him, we do it in faith. Must believe that He exists and that He would. He rewards those who seek Him. You know, one of the blessings of my personal relationship with Him is that He's rewarding me. He rewards me. It's not just eternal. It's not just eternal. He rewards you today. He gives you the security of answered prayer and the joys of seeing lives changed. And He gives you the power of overcoming. He's rewarding each and every day. Never forget how He's rewarding in your life. That eternal reward's coming. Rewards that we can't even understand are coming because of faith. Faith is confidence in our life. Hebrews 10. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We don't have to worry about that ultimate final judgment. But we are of those who have faith. Why? Because we preserve, we walk, our souls are preserved because of faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's a genuine faith, it is faith for life forever. Ultimately, victory is ours because of that faith. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. This world is a nasty place. This world is nothing but adversity. This world is sin, cursed, it is, there is evil throughout this world. It is a challenge for you and I who are followers of Jesus Christ. Every day it's a challenge. And we overcome. When we overcome, it's because of the strength of our faith in Jesus Christ. He is the object of our faith. He is the key. This is the victory, this faith that has overcome the world, our faith, because we exercise it in Jesus Christ. So what is our response? What is your response? 
Basically, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm in charge. I'm in control. My kingdom will come. Will you be a part of it? Will you not? Will you be in the family of God? Are you a part of the family of God? Or have you chosen to live life your own way? Do you want to do things your own way? If that's the case, the Lord says to us, the result will be the judgment and wrath of God. If I say, Lord, I'm yours, I will follow you. My life belongs to you. I give it to you. I will use it for your glory. The result of that is the reward and blessing of God. It's a choice that we make every day. Luke chapter 9. Jesus says to us, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I will not follow the sin impulses of my heart. You know, if anyone have to deny myself, I have sin impulses in my heart. They're pulling constantly against me. They're always pulling against us. They pull us. They want to pull us away from the Lord. They want to pull us to do our own thing. We have to take up our cross every day. There's a cost to following Jesus Christ. We have to say no. We have to say no to things that are harmful in our life. We have to say no to situations that would cause harm in our life, to the testimony of Jesus Christ. We have to say no to those things. We have to take up our cross. We have to be willing to identify with Jesus Christ no matter the cost, just as he did, just as he went to the cross for you and I. And we have to follow him. I will follow and I will obey Jesus Christ. Here's the beautiful thing. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. That's it. That's the simplicity of Jesus Christ. It's simply hearing his voice from the, from the pages of the Word of God, from the prompting and leading of the Spirit of God, from the followers of Jesus Christ in your life who help you to see Christ, to follow him, from his church that equips and guides and helps. It is simply this, the believer, the one who is the, the man and woman of faith, does so because we simply hear the voice of Jesus Christ, the prompting of Christ, and we listen, and we follow. May that be your testimony today. Jesus Christ, over your life. May the Lord challenge your heart and mind to that commitment. Thanks again for joining us. We'll be with you again next week, and we step into some real changes in the chapters to come.